Hello, I'm Lynn Jarvis, contributing editor, joined by WCX-TV's Sharon Meyer, and our Italian adventure continues here on Across the Fence. Along with great food and hospitality, there is so much history and fine art here in Italy. What's ahead for us today, Sharon? If things go as planned, while we're in Rome, we're going to try to visit the Vatican and then head over to the Isle of Capri, places on our must-see list. But first, why don't we find a street cafe to enjoy some pizza and spaghetti? Did you know Italians lead the world in wine consumption? No, but everyone seems very happy over here. When the stars make you drool Just like pasta fazool That's amore Excuse me, but you see Back in old Napoli That's amore That's amore Rome is the capital of Italy and is the country's most populated city with 2.7 million people. It's the most popular tourist attraction in Italy and the 11th most visited city in the world. And tucked in the middle of all this is Vatican City, which is actually the smallest country in the world. Dominating Rome since its beginnings in 1753 BC is the Tiber River. 350 miles long, it was and still is critically important to Roman trade and commerce. From St. Angelo's Bridge, we got a look at the Vatican's St. Paul's Cathedral, not that far away. Closer, though, is the Colosseum, and my husband Rainey and our video editor, Marco Ayala, joined the long line for a tour. In our world of skyscrapers and stadiums, the Colosseum from 80 AD that held 50,000 spectators is still very impressive. One can just imagine how stunning it would have looked, decorated with glistening shields and its arches filled with statues of emperors and gods. Antiquities are still being found and are being stored in the Colosseum's outer halls and chambers. Guarding these treasures is this spunky black cat who knows the hiding place of every Colosseum mouse. Two grand entrances, one at each end of the structure, were used by the aristocracy and their guests. The emperor, though, had a private entrance which went below ground and emerged in the royal box. The most popular event was the duel of the gladiators who arrived in chariots and gathered before him with shouts of, Hail Emperor! Men soon to die salute thee! Many less violent kinds of entertainment, however, such as chariot races, circus acts, and drama, are all part of its history. Many of Rome's historic treasures lie within eyesight of the Colosseum, like Circus Maximus. It covers a small valley and was and still is Rome's largest venue for public games, concerts, and meetings. And the nearby Forum is a huge complex of ruins, once the legal, social, and business center of ancient Rome. All those who visit Rome come to the Trevi Fountain. It stands 85 feet high and 65 feet across and on a warm summer day, it's the place to be. It was built in the 15th century to mark the end of the Aqua Virgo, a man-made channel that brought fresh water to Roman bathhouses. Tossing a coin into the fountain, according to legend, will guarantee a return trip to Rome. The fountain is swept every morning and the money is donated to Caritas, an Italian charity, well over $4,000 a day. Built more than 1,800 years ago, the Pantheon still stands as a reminder of the enduring Roman Empire. Near the entrance is a marble statue of young Julius Caesar, perhaps the greatest emperor of them all. The Pantheon is still used as a church for masses and ceremonies such as weddings and baptisms. Above the altar is the famous dome, with its large opening that allows worshippers to look towards heaven and is the Pantheon's only light source during daylight hours. At the foot of the Spanish Steps, we found the Barcaccia Fountain, claiming the best water in northern Italy. Nearly everyone, young and old, stopped to fill their water bottles. 
or just splash some of that cool water on hot and sweaty brows. Completed in 1725, the stairway with 138 steps connects the fountain to Trinita de Monte, a church consecrated by Pope Sixtus in 1585. And we did climb every step, and from the top is a nice view of the Spanish Square and Condotti Street stretching into the distance. We turned a corner, stepped into another country, and there it was, St. Peter's Basilica, the jewel of Vatican City and the largest church in the world. It is the namesake of St. Peter, one of the 12 apostles who was buried here. After the crucifixion, he took leadership among the followers of Jesus and played a significant role in the founding of the Christian religion. Vatican City is the seat of the Roman Catholic Church and the residence of the Pope since 1377. Since that time, there have been 265 popes in uninterrupted succession, a most impressive statistic considering the turbulence of the times. The nave in St. Peter's is more than 715 feet in length, with its dome some 450 feet across. Standing in the immense basilica is a humbling experience. There are some 45 altars here, each decorated by famous artists such as Cristofari, Bernini, and Michelangelo. Vatican City is the largest museum in the world, and we were told if one minute were taken to look at every object, it would take over 10 years. That, of course, is impossible, but the one thing that every visitor looks for is the Pieta. Many of every religion are brought to tears when they see Michelangelo's masterpiece of the grieving Mary holding her dead son after the crucifixion. At Rome, we climbed aboard the high-speed train for the two-hour ride to Naples, where we caught a hydrofoil across a part of the Mediterranean Sea. And three hours later, we've arrived at the island of Capri. I've always wanted to visit this island in the Tyrrhenian Sea in the Campania region of southern Italy. Back in 1934, the song Isle of Capri was recorded and it became a huge worldwide hit, sung in countless arrangements and translations. It was one of my mother's favorite songs, but she never got to visit here. So this is for you, Mom. Twas on the Isle of Capri that I found her Beneath the shade of an old walnut tree Oh, I can still see the flowers blooming round her Where we met on the Isle of Capri She was as sweet as the rose at the dawning But somehow fate hadn't met her for me And though I sailed with the tide in the morn Still my heart's on the Isle of Capri. You can see why people have been coming here for centuries. This tiny island is just four miles long and two miles wide. Known for its dazzling beauty, writers, artists, and musicians have long been drawn to its shores. The island's first tourists were the Romans, and even Emperor Augustus himself, as early as 29 BC, would summer here. Today, the island is more popular than ever with some two million annual visitors. Most tourists cluster around the marinas and luxury hotels, leaving much of the island's west end virtually empty. And that's why we chose to stay in Anna Capri, meaning Upper Capri, at a small hotel where every night we got this glorious sunset view over the Tyrrhenian Sea. Within walking distance of our hotel was Um Um, famous for three-minute pizzas made in a wood-fired oven, and really good. Please join us for pizza prepared by Chef Umberto.
We decided to sail around Capri and we went to the marina to find a captain and we needed someone who spoke English. We were directed to Constanzo Sorrentino and being a windy day, we asked him what to expect. With this wind, this kind of wind is a westerly wind and uh, the uh, most important wind about the waves in, in Capri uh, Island because uh, the western side is open and uh, uh, the waves uh, have the opportunity uh, uh, to work on the sea. Uh, that's why we will find the, uh, the big waves uh, from westerly. Um, the other winds uh, like eastern and the northern uh, uh, waves uh, are not too much, you know, just windy, but uh, doesn't form the waves. Just in the west? Just west and southwest. The westerly windy as the most, the most stormy uh, and the strongest waves and, and windy. With that somewhat ominous prediction, we climbed aboard the small boat for our three-hour cruise. We were a little apprehensive as the wind was quite strong even in the sheltered harbor. When we reached open sea, we knew that we were in for a rough ride but Costanzo assured us that we would be fine and to enjoy the ride. Being so rough, we could not enter the famous Blue Grotto, so we opted for the White Grotto in a cave on land. After climbing the well-worn steps, we made our way into the chamber filled with limestone stalactites and stalagmites glowing in the filtered sun from a natural opening at one end of the cave that provided a spectacular view of the Bay of Naples. And from water level, here's a unique view of Capri's famous sea stacks. Stella on the left attached to Mezzo and Scopolo to the right. Costanzo offered the invitation to swim through the green grotto. Only our brave video editor Marco accepted. We waited anxiously as the sea pounded the grotto. Minutes passed and finally he appeared in the aqua water. What's it like, Marco? It was great. It was very rough. Very rough, yeah. And the water is very salty. You afraid? A uh, little bit when you... A little when you, bit when I was coming yeah. out. Yes, when you come out. But it, it was great. It's great, yes, I know. Yeah. Our small boat rocked and rolled, and by this time our stomachs were feeling a little queasy, and we were glad to see calmer waters ahead. What an adventure with memories for a lifetime, and a big thanks to our captain and guide, Costanzo, for getting us back safe and sound. As with all good things, our Italian adventure has come to an end, and what an exciting place to explore with all the history, art, and culture. I would like to come back again, wouldn't you, Sharon? Absolutely, and along with everything that you mentioned, the people are wonderful. They sure know how to cook. I think we've all gained at least a few pounds over these past two weeks, and the scenery, especially here in Isle Capri, just gorgeous. I couldn't agree more, and I'm Lynn Jarvis for Across the Fence, and from both of us here on the Isle of Capri. Thanks for watching.